All right, people, uh, we're continuing our series in the book of Philippians, wonderful book uh, written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison. And uh, I want to ask you to turn, if you will, to chapter 2, and I want to read to you from verse 12 through to verse 18. But the, the title of, of our sermon today, to fit in with our series, is we're talking about the joy. Philippians is known to be the epistle or the letter of joy, that even though the circumstances that Paul wrote them in were, were anything but nice, the man had a joy that was way down in the in his depth of his soul. There was, there was a joy there that circumstances could not affect. In fact, the harder they became, the more joyful it would seem that he became. And it's the beauty of this joy that we're talking about today. But today, it's almost like a paradox. Well, it is a paradox. We're talking about the joy of sacrifice. That's a paradox because it's two opposite truths. And found in the middle is, is the blend of a, a beautiful truth that incorporates both. There is joy in sacrifice. Now that goes against prevailing wisdom. Prevailing wisdom says, I'm joyful when people sacrifice for me. But the Apostle Paul illustrates so beautifully in his writings today that there is joy in service. There is joy in sacrifice. So let me just read this to you. Verse 12, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have already always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and act according to His good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and deep depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. In order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing, but even if I am being poured out, listen to this, that even though I am being poured out like a, like a drink offering on the sacrifice and the services coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice and be joyful with me. It's that terminology that I want to try and capture and bring out some sort of deeper meaning. But he talks about a, a drink offering, a drink offering. And he says the drink offering is that which is poured out upon the sacrifice and service of the people who he loved. There is a thing in the Old Testament that runs through, the application continues through into the New Testament of this thing, this ritual called a drink offering. Now, we're going to delve back into the Old Testament. I'm going to read another passage to you in a moment that talks about what a drink offering is. But remember this, and I've said this many times to you, that when you preach Old Testament stuff, generally in the Old Testament, you preach with very broad strokes. Remember we said that before? You're just putting the background to pictures that the New Testament comes to bring in this sort of detail. But we preach it with broad strokes uh, with, with a purpose to give us a background to what this is all about. A drink offering is a unique thing. Now, when we preach Old Testament, we're looking for a few things. We're looking for parallels. We're looking for pictures. And we're looking for principles. And as we take those with broad strokes and apply them into a New Testament and to a modern-day context, we have the background set for us. So it's this drink offering thing that I would like for us to refer to today. There are a number of references to drink offerings, but let me just read to you the one, and I'm sure you will get the picture. If you'd like to turn to Numbers chapter 15, and I'm going to read the first 12 verses to you. Pick up on the application, and I will deal with the implication of the drink offering. This is how they were told to do it. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, After you enter the land I'm giving you as a home, and you present to the Lord offerings made by fire from the herd or the flock, as an aroma pleasing to the Lord, whether burnt offering or sacrifices for special vows or free will offering or festival offering, then the one who brings this offering shall present to the Lord a grain offering of a tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with a quart of hen of oil. With each lamb for the burnt offering or the sacrifice, prepare a quarter of a hen of wine as a drink 
offering. With a ram, prepare a grain offering of tenth of an ephah of fine flour with a third of a hen of, of, of uh, oil and a third of a hen of wine as a drink offering. Offer it as an aroma. These are key words that you're going to hear about today. Aroma, drink offering, for pleasing to the Lord. When you prepare a young bull as a burnt offering or sacrifice for a special vow or a fellowship offering to the Lord, bring with the bull a grain offering of three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with half a hen of oil. Also bring half a hen of wine as a drink offering. It will be made an offering made by fire and aroma pleasing to the Lord. Three times, they're told, on each one of those offerings to bring. It's kind of like the full step. At the end of the sentence of you making your Old Testament offering, they would bring a lamb or an animal of some sort. They would sacrifice it, kill it, shed the blood, put it on the altar. And then at the end, after it was burning, they would pour this, this drink offering over the offering that they had just sacrificed. But there were a few implications that as I read this that I thought might be interesting for you to see. The first thing is that all of the offerings that were made that we've seen depicted in the passage so far are, are offerings that are are significant of the work of Jesus. They all shed blood. There was trespass offerings. There were sin offerings. There were peace offerings. So many different types of offerings, each one having a significance, but every single one pointing to the person of Jesus Christ. And if Jesus fulfilled every one of those offerings, because every lamb, every bull, every bird that was ever sacrificed was simply pointing to the ultimate sacrifice where God would bring His own lamb to His own sacrifice, the Lamb of God, Jesus. So all of those offerings that ever were made in the Old Testament pointed to the sacrifice of, of Jesus. So this drink offering speaks of the joy. We talk about joy, people. The joy of the accomplishment of the work of Christ. God has done an incredible work. And we're so doom and gloomy you know, that we forget the joy of the accomplishment of Jesus as signified by the, His shed blood. And the wine that was used was a symbol of joy. Wine was a symbol in itself of, of joy. And they would pour this on to their offering. But here's a few little innuendos that are interesting. The first little innuendo that I find interesting is that this innuendo was, was reserved for those who in a modern day context would call themselves believers. It was said that this, that it says that when you enter the land, then you can complete the offering with a, with a drink offering. While you were still in the wilderness in the Old Testament, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, while you were still in the wilderness, you never completed your offering with a, with a drink offering. You could only go so far. But he says this, God tells Moses that when you enter the land, what land? Well, let's take a little journey. Take a little journey here of the children of Israel. In the book of Exodus, we find them in Egypt. We find the children of Egypt in Egypt, and it's the place where it's depicted by the world, Egypt. It's a, it's a place that is typical of what the world is, where, where the, the gods of Egypt were, were pride and, and prosperity and popularity and power. And that was the land of Egypt. And God came and said to Pharaoh through Moses, let my people go. They need to get out of this land. And so we know that Moses led them out of the land, across the Red Sea, into this place that we call the wilderness. Forty years they lived in the wilderness of wandering. It was dry and it was dusty. And it was kind of took place around a mountain. And they walked in and said, round and round and round this mountain, this was Mount Sinai, and on Mount Sinai the law was given, and for the most of the 40 years they were just taking laps around Mount Sinai. It was actually a two-day, I mean a 10-day or a two-day walk to get to where they would ultimately go into the promised land, but they spent 40 years of wandering round and round and round the mountain of Sinai until that whole generation had died out. And then God said, your journey now will continue to the promised land. They had to cross another water. This was the Jordan River out of the wilderness into the promised land. Now the promised land was a land that was full of milk and honey. It was the land that was destined to be beautiful and productive for them. But the problem with the promised land is 
They were giants that inhabited this land. They were very mean, big old giants living in there. And they looked at rather tough. They had swords and they had shields and they looked rather mean and they were very big. And the writing suggests that in comparison to these giants, the Israelites were just little like grasshoppers in their presence. They were tiny. They were enemies in the land. Now this is what God said, that the first place that you can make your offering is here. You weren't allowed to make this drink offering while you lived here. Here you did all the services, here you made all the sacrifices, but you never experienced the joy that was service and sacrifice until you got here. Is that not like the journey of the Christian? Where God calls us out of Egypt, which is like the world, and we come to know Christ and we, we get rid of the values that the world had upon us. And we say, no, there's something more than living in a world where prosperity and power and popularity are the, are the, are the things of the day, are the desired things. And we become Christians as we enter through the waters here, significant of, of the blood of Jesus. And we come into the wilderness and we stay in the wilderness, let me tell you, for as long as you want to stay. You don't have to stay there very long. You see, it's the reason the children of Israel stayed for so long in the wilderness. They were slow learning people. God refers to them as stiff-necked people. You know why they had a stiff neck? It's because they were in here but kept looking back there. They kept looking back to Egypt and they would grumble and they would moan. And they would say to Moses, hey Moses, back in Egypt, we, we had food. Back in, Moses, in Egypt, Moses, we had, we had water, we had houses. We had, we, I know we were slaves, but at least we had all those things. And they grumbled against God and against Moses while they were living in the wilderness. So God had to teach them that he's not going to take grumblers into the promised land. God is not into grumbling people. God is not interested in people who are stiff-necked looking back to the things they had when they were back there in the world. And if you want to move into this place of the promised land where your drink offering is legitimate, you have to cross this line to get there. Does that make sense? So this reserve offering is left for people who are, are living or have journeyed into the promised land. Oh, I know there are giants there. Some of them are formidable. Some of them are mean. But this is the land of victory. And with every victory they made their sacrifice, they would pour the drink offering significant of the joy of the victory that they had. There was no victory in the wilderness very few. And therefore, there was not a legitimate offering to put your drink offering on your offering while you lived in the wilderness. Think about that from our own personal context. It's crazy, crazy good. You see, when they moved into the land of the promise, yeah, these enemies, they were moving into land that for many would have seen, been to, seen to be the land of the unknown. Nobody had been there before. A couple of spies had gone out across into this land, and they had seen the giants and reported thus when they got back. But this is the land of the unknown. There's no roadmaps there. Nobody's been there before. And it's a scary place to go. It's also the land of the perceived impossible. Because as they would have looked at those giants, and Joshua would have said to the people after he took over from Moses, guys, we need to go into the land. They would have said, Joshua, nice thought. The problem is there are giants in the land. And it's impossible to defeat these giants. People, this is where we need to live today. If there are people in our church today, it's wonderful that you are here. I'm so glad you are. If you still recognize that you're in Egypt, your first step is to get into this area here. And through the waters of redemption, it's a big word. It just simply means where you commit your life to follow Jesus and not the world anymore. But the journey does not stop there. The next thing that was significant was that this offering was to be offered after the services and sacrifices had been completed. And that's why you could only do it here. Because this was the time when service and sacrifice was ordained. Book of Leviticus, Deuteronomy, you see all the laws of God being given, all the services, all the sacrificial routines and rituals. That took place here. But it, only when they entered into the land of victory could they add the drink offering to that. Now, when I think of the, the wonder of, of this being offered after service and sacrifice. I think of that beautiful story in 2 Samuel chapter 23 of David with his three mighty men. One of my favorite stories, man. David with his three mighty men. They'd been fighting all day 
And uh, they went, retreated back to the cave for some rest. And David, as he sat down in the cave, uttered something out of his mouth that three of his mighty men, these were men who had done exploits far greater than David had done. They were his mighty men, and they were faithful to their king, David. And David sat down, and he uttered these words. He said, man, I would love a drink. I would love a drink of the water that from the well outside Bethlehem. And three of his mighty men heard him say that. And they probably looked at each other and said, man, his wish is out. Come on. If he wants that, we're going to go get it. The only problem was they would have had to lay down their lives probably in order for them to get the water because they were surrounded. There were Philistines everywhere. They would have had to break through the ranks of the Philistine in order to get to Bethlehem to draw the water that David wanted. But they did it. Miraculously, they got the water and they, miraculously they got back. In the morning, I get this picture of David waking up and looking up into the sky and getting his, the, sort of the, the dust out of his eyes. He looks up and, and there's his three mighty men, his three generals standing with smiles upon their faces. And he looks at them and he says, hey, guys, what are you standing there for? Why are you looking at me? They said, hey, David, we got you the water. Here's your water. He said, what water? Oh, there was the water that you mentioned last night at the well outside Bethlehem. David, we got you. Your water, David, was blown away. He couldn't believe it. He stood to his feet and he looked at his three generals and he was completely confused. He said, guys, did you really offer to lay your down self down as a sacrifice, as a service to me? Would you really do that? Yeah, he did. And he took the water. They thought he was going to drink it. But we read in the passage that David took that water and he poured it out kind of like a drink offering, after the victory and the celebration of their sacrifice and service, David had drink the water. He poured it out, says, before the Lord. They stood back and said, hey, why are you doing that, David? We sacrificed our lives for that. And David said this, it's as if I were drinking your blood, if I were to drink this water. You've just seen the AGM report. Lots of service and sacrifice took place. Billy's report could have gone on all day about people who have poured their lives into our church sacrificially. People who have served this church for many years. I just look at some of the heroes of our church. You know, we look at the, the Hanson brothers and their beautiful wives. We look at, you know, at, at, you know, just so many people, for goodness sake, that live in this church, have been here for so long, and we see how they have served this church, made huge sacrifices for the cause of the church. If I were to change the context of that story, story remain the same, but the context changed. This is what I would suggest it might look like. This church has got many mighty men, mentioned a few. Mighty women are included in that. These are the generals who have led this church over the course of these years, 136 years. There have been some great generals along the way who have done that. And these are the mighty men of David, typified by them. And then you see David being pictured maybe like the church, and I represent the church today because I get to stand behind the pulpit, and I get to take the sacrifices and the offerings that you good people have made, and I get to stand here, as it were, and pour those out to the Lord with great joy to say, God, these good people have made incredible sacrifices. These good people have offered incredible service to your church. We pour all of that out as unto you, just like a drink offering, and we do it with joy. That's why what I have to say today so fits in with what Bill said just now. When he mentioned just a few folk who have just poured their lives into this, and now we get to celebrate by taking all of that. And if I could take every good work, every car, you know, park, car, park, every deacon, every elder, every Genesis volunteer, every church volunteer, every kids church volunteer, every, every member of staff, our pastors, our elders, you know, if everybody who serves here, the people who, who keep our church clean, the keep people who cut our lawns and look after our garden so beautifully. If I could take all of those things and put them into a jar, we could stand here today in a typical fashion and say, guys, check this out. And I could pour all of those beautiful sacrificial actions out as unto the Lord, just like a drink offering, with great celebration and great joy. I mentioned to you as well just now, the terminology of the aroma. Apparently in those days when you made a burnt offering, there was often a lot of smell that was repugnant and was not a very nice smell that came off the burnt offerings. Apparently what they would do is take this wine and sometimes there would be a gallon of wine at a time and they would pour this 
as the full stop at the end of the sacrifice of the offering, and it would mix with the blood, and a beautiful smell would then rise up from the offering that had been burnt. It was an aroma, and the aroma, in a sense, was what was taken up to God, and God would be so pleased with the aroma of the offering. Well, I wonder if I'm not stretching my imagination just a a little too far, but I get this picture of God in, in heaven today. And he's looking at his angels saying, hey guys, what's that great smell? There's an aroma that's filling heaven right now. Where is it? Where's that aroma coming from? Angels, tell me. Where's the aroma coming from? And the angels would smile and say, sir, God, it's coming from the Norwegian Settlers Church. As they have poured out their service and their sacrifice as a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord. There's a beautiful smell in heaven today because of your service and your, your sacrifice. So God says thank you to you for that. It's not us saying thank you to you. It's his kingdom anyway. It's his church. He says thank you to you all for your service and your sacrifice. But let's just put this into our, another context very quickly. Oh, gosh, we're in a hurry. Um, let's personalize this for a moment. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul says this. He says, I am being poured out like a drink offering. It's his last words that he's written. He's lived his life. I fought the fight. I've kept the faith. I've done all of that. Now there's henceforth a a, a prize, a crown waiting for me. I am being poured out, and he uses the terminology, like a drink offering. I want to suggest to you today that this drink offering thing comes in the form, if if you allow me a bit of poetic license here, picture a, a bucket here. And on the day that you were born, God gave you the bucket, And this bucket is full of potential. This is you personalizing this particular concept. And your bucket is full of potential. And as you go through life to live out your potential, unfortunately, this particular bucket has got leaks in it. And there's stuff that's coming out. And it's leaking. And I want to suggest to you that some of those leaks that are stopping your potential, because at the end of the day, with great sadness, if you don't plug these holes, your potential will drain away, that at the end of the day, you will have nothing left to pour on your offering. So you've got to guard this potential. And I want to suggest to you things like disobedience, like Jonah. Jonah had a huge hole in his bucket. And all, all, of the, all of his potential was oozing out because he was disobedient to God. Some people have a huge hole of unforgiveness. That's a big boy. And there's a lot of stuff coming out. You're losing your potential when you fail to forgive. When you become bitter and, and resentful and pessimistic. And you, you're procrastinating. You're doing all those things. Every one of these holes is draining all of your potential. And the sad thing is that at the end of your life, or some people not even at the end, you look in the bucket of your potential, and there's nothing left. It's all been drained on the rubbish that there is out there. Then there's another bucket. This is the bucket of opportunity. On the day that you were born, God gave you We read in Ephesians chapter 2 that God has prepared in advance before you were even born. God had prepared in advance good works for you to do. Works that would mean something meaningful, that would bring change to the world around you. God ordained before you were born that there would be great things that you would do for His kingdom. And as you look at this, you see, man, this bucket is full of opportunity. Opportunity all over the place. And have I used that opportunity? Well, if you look at Paul as an example... Paul is looking back over his life and says, yes, I have fought the fight. I've kept the faith. I've run the race. I've seized every opportunity I can. And now as I look to God, my bucket is empty. There is nothing left. How tragic would it be if you got to the end of your days and the curtain is about to close on your life and you look into the bucket of potential opportunity that you had to serve God and your bucket is half full. That's a tragic thing. There's nothing more tragic than leaving this life with a bucket that is half, three quarters, or at least not empty. Every one of us should end our lives with this bucket being empty because we have seized every opportunity to 
to do something meaningful for the Lord. Let's skip to the end. Today, I want to suggest to you, that as much as we celebrate what God has done through your special sacrifices and services to the church, His church, and we celebrate that with great joy as He does as well, I want to suggest to you today that there's another year still to come. And in order for you to be able to do what you need to do this coming year, it's not all about the past, it's all about the future as well, that I would like for you to leave today with a bucket full, at least this one full. That the bucket will be full of new opportunities for you for the coming year. There will be new things for you to do, new things to become involved in, new prayers to pray, new lessons to learn. There's going to be a whole bunch of new stuff in the, in the year that is still to come. So that by the end of next year, this bucket of today can be refilled as you leave this place. And I'm going to pray that God would do that for you. And then when you come back to us next year, to the next AGM, you'll walk in here with an empty bucket. To say, God, this last year, from last year where I came with an empty bucket and you filled it up, Lord, my bucket is empty again. I have seized every opportunity to serve you and to serve your kingdom. So I want to close the service today by praying that God would, would fill our buckets. Not to remain filled, but to be emptied over the course of this year with a you responding to the new opportunities. Because it doesn't end here. Today is just the drink offering day. But the drink offering is prophetic as well. To another victory. To another drink offering. To another victory. To another drink offering. And if we could compartmentalize this into years, I would say today is drink offering day. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. Let's celebrate that as they would have a drink offering. Don't hang around there too long. There's too much other stuff to do. There are opportunities that are going to come across your path this year. And I really pray today that as you leave from our church today, your bucket will be full. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for the beauty of what we've spoken about, the beautiful picture of the, the drink offering. Lord, it's only relevant to us as believers who in a spiritual sense are in the promised land, a land of victory. It's full of many challenges, we know that. But it's a land of victory. And with every victory, we get to celebrate with the joy of sacrifice. Father, we want to thank you too for the bucket of potential that you've given to us. And we need to look into our own lives. We read that just now to, to, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And Lord, we need to look at our potential back and say, what's leaking here? Why is my potential down? Maybe it's because I'm unforgiving and I'm bitter and I'm angry and I'm twisted and, and maybe I'm just pessimistic. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe there's secret sin in your life that is a big hole in your bucket and, and taking away all your potential. Oh God, today we need to plug that bucket before we lose any more. But thank you too, Lord, for the bucket of opportunity that you give to every one of us. And it's been beautiful to see this last year, so many in our church responding to that opportunity to say, yes, I want to serve God. And I'm going to be faithful to the church. I'm going to be faithful to Him. And I'm going to serve Him with every ounce of energy within me so that at the end of this year, my bucket will be empty. And I will come back to the AGM next year and I'll be able to say, Hey, Trev, my bucket's empty. I have served and I have sacrificed for the cause of the kingdom, not for me. And you will applaud them because the aroma of their sacrifice will rise to your nostrils and you will be blessed and happy. Help us to understand these truths and to live them up really, really well this coming year. Until the next AGM, when we arrive with our empty buckets. Help us, we pray, in your name. Amen.